still this meeting's being live streamed got it so we are live on youtube as well welcome to those of you who are watching either right now on youtube during the live stream still. or those who are watching it after the fact, revisiting it or watching it for the first time who couldn't be here in person. Welcome to the gathering. We're so excited to be seeing everyone virtually again, and we're ready to get started now. So I'll turn it over to Allison. Well, thank you, Alana. Uh, welcome everyone. As Alana said, we haven't gathered in this format for a while. It is glad to see everyone virtually. We do plan to keep rotating these monthly volunteer gatherings between in-person and virtual formats and to keep hosting them on the third Tuesday of the month at 5.30 for the most part. And in just a bit, we'll welcome our featured presenter, Leslie Reese, who will speak about the tenant period in Rancho history and one of her favorite storytellers. Also, as a hint, next month's featured speaker will be Marie, who will be talking about the summer solstice since the third Tuesday happens to be June 21st. That one will also be virtual, but then we'll be back in person in July. However, before we get started, we do have some site updates. So looking back to advance forward, our stormwater uh, retention project, which I notably have been talking about since 2019, is actually starting. So construction starts this month. The lower parking lot lay down area where Griffith will store all their materials will be set up May 26 and 27th. Trenching on the site will be happening during the month of June. The cistern which is the biggest part of this, will be going in between uh, July 5th and July 15th. This is the one period that I think also for all of volunteers need to know that the entire site will be closed to the public. So there won't be any tours or public hours between July 5th and 15th. Then starting right after that, the permeable paving will be going in, and that is replacing the soil cement area. And then the pavers in front of the visitor center. That should all be completed, you know, fingers crossed by the end of August. Then the overlook goes in, the final plantings from September is our demobilization month. And this will all be done right before our gala, which is on September 24th, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So that is exciting. We are starting that project. It is happening. It's, it's a go. It is a go. If you sense any nervousness on my part, you are apt because I've talked about it for several years and we're here. <laughs> so... Gives me some heart palpitations, but thank you, Marie. I'm excited. <laughs> um, visitorship. Visitorship set record levels during the first quarter of 22, when we welcomed almost 2,000 visitors, which is considerably higher than our pre-pandemic level, which was a little over 1,500 in 2019, a little over 1,600 in 2020, and then a little over 1,721 with a plug on TikTok and our new ex exhibition. We nearly doubled that quarter one amount in April alone with 1,600. Absolutely amazing. Thank you, Laura, to tracking all those hours. And thank you to all the volunteers to tracking those hours and welcoming visitors and being behind the scenes to ensure that our site looks great for those who visit. Really impressive numbers. And really just points out how much public facing our site is and is even more becoming to the public. Speaking of that, site use, private rentals is also way up this year. Uh, this has become a big revenue source for the Rancho and we thank Mallory, our site use coordinator, 
who is making our site much more known as a place to have a beautiful event at. And this will continue on. We are, of course, managing expectations between site use and programming. However, we are becoming more and more popular, which is great news for the site and our accessibility in the community. Also, this summer, we were fortunate through the Getty to host two Getty Marrow interns this summer. One will be in education, working with Alana on summer camps and some programming ideas. And the other will be working with Carlos in curatorial. We are planning a library exhibit in curatorial plus some other items. So we are confirming the details on who our two interns will be. Um, they will be starting at the beginning of June. And we hope you'll keep an eye out for them and give them, of course, a very warm Rancho welcome. As many of you know, Tessa, who was our Director of Development, has left us. She is now the Director of Development at, at Santa Monica College Foundation. As an update, she started yesterday. And one of her comments to me was, I'm going to enjoy it but I hate being new and having to relearn everything. But she has the Rancho in her heart and she's very connected to the Rancho. So you'll see her at the site. I know she's starting a new job, a little bit nervous, but she's gonna be absolutely excellent. As Alana will talk about in a little bit, camp signups are underway. The dates are the camps between July 18th and August 13th. And Alana, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, they are filling up fast. So we got campers. Hot commodity, you know. There you go. We're a hot commodity. Also, uh, please put on your calendars in pen. I'm not sure if you can do pen and Outlook, but you can try it. You can lock it in is our 2022 gala is September 24th, 5 p.m. The We will have three honorees and the theme will be tied to the current exhibit, looking at the concepts of home. There'll be more to come, but we're looking at our sponsorship levels as being the themes of the exhibit. Is home self-defining? Is it memory? Is it place? So we're connecting everything we're doing with the gala to the exhibit. And our three honorees will also be speaking about home. And I have to admit, I can't announce them yet because we need to do the formal requests. But that will be coming up shortly. Tickets will be 195. Tables will be 1,950. I love how that math works. Um, but we'll have much more details. We have our next committee meeting coming up. So there, and that is just like the peak of all the activity that's happening at the Rancho. We have artful storytelling. We've got Adobe Days Revisited. We have the festival that Carlos will be talking about. There's so much, but I just want to give kind of the, the big, big um, updates so that's where we're at. It's an exciting time. We've got a lot going on. And right now I am going to pass the mic to Megan, who's going to introduce our tonight's speaker, Leslie Reese. Thank you, Allison. It is an exciting time to be at the Rancho and to be rolling back on site with a lot of different activities. Um, or to continue something we never did before, the pandemic, these virtual gatherings to continue to gather online and to also um, provide wonderful opportunities on site. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce our featured speaker, Leslie Reese. Not only is she the proud mom of RLC staff member, Alana Reese, but Leslie has been a volunteer at the Rancho for 30 years. That's right, she started here in 1992. Over the years, she has served as a tour docent, portraying a wide array of characters, including Rafael Acota for public tours, Susan Bixby for school tours, even a quote, overzealous temperance lady for one of our holiday programs. She's a Spanish speaker, and so Leslie has also contributed that valuable skill to the Rancho, 
She has conducted many public tours and in fact, some youth tours in Spanish. She was a founding member of the Hispanic History Committee back when that was under the um, auspices of the Friends Volunteer Association. And she brought two different sets of high school students here who she worked with at their high schools on a scene from a pastorela when we did an 1850s Christmas candlelight tour. Those scenes were done entirely in Spanish by students taking Spanish. Uh, before my time here, Leslie also worked with her fellow RLC players to write and perform a play called Visitors from the Past. You might notice that title was what we started our living history tours with, but before it was ever a possibility of having regular living history tours, we had this imagined meeting of Rancho families that took place uh, with a long stage here. Uh, the two temples, the two Jotham and Margaret Bixby, and then the two uh, later Bixby's here, and Leslie was part of that. So she's done a lot for the Rancho in her professional life. Leslie is a professor emerita from Cal State Long Beach in the teacher education program, and also the leadership development department. Here, uh, for those two departments, she taught courses in diversity and equity in education and in qualitative research methods. Her research has focused on areas of linguistic minority rights, culturally responsive pedagogy, and literacy development among Spanish-speaking children in both the U.S. and Mexico. And all of that good research has resulted in the publication of over 50 different research articles and book chapters. She retired last year and that was fortunate for us because she has been bringing her research and program development background to help support Rancho activities. Over the past year or two, she has served on the DEIA committee, that's the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Accessibility Committee. She's been working on uh, creating a Spanish tour training for future docents, more on that later. And she's been assisting with archival research on the oral histories from the tenant period. And that's what we've brought her here to speak about tonight. Leslie will discuss this uh, period and promises to share some of the stories that didn't make it into the exhibit. Uh, stories about ghosts and dungeons and buried treasures, and especially about Mike Murillo, uh, Uncle Mike to Concepcion Coronado Liera, uh, who is quite a storyteller and has become one of uh, Leslie's favorite characters at the Rancho. As you listen to her presentation, I hope you'll put questions in the chat, whether you're listening on Zoom or listening on YouTube. Uh, put them in as they occur to you so you don't forget them. But at the end of the period, we will have a question and answer session uh, for Leslie. You can save your questions till then, but you can also put them in the chat, as I'm saying, and she'll address them after the presentation. Leslie? Well, thank you very much, Megan. And, um, Thank you to everyone who's here. I can't see your faces, but I've seen the names come up. So um, I appreciate your uh, joining me. I'm gonna um, go ahead and try to uh, share my screen here. Um, is that looking okay? So um, as Megan said, um, I volunteered to uh, help out with the um, uh, Jaisis exhibit and Carlos took me up on it and asked me to read through the uh, transcription of oral interviews that were done with Mexican and Mexican American families who had been tenants at the Rancho, um, looking for stories in, the, in their interviews that could be connected and used in the Raices exhibit. But as you can imagine, there are many, many more stories that didn't make it in. And um, I hope some of these will be uh, new to you. They were, they were fun for, for me. Um, as you know, the tenant period, we're looking at um, the period, whoops, the period in between the time that um, Jotham Bixby and his family moved away from the ranch in 1881, uh, moved to Los Angeles. And the time that uh, Llewellyn Bixby Sr. remodeled the uh, home in 1930 into the um, dwelling that uh, we see today. And that 40 year period in between um, was occupied by tenants and um, is just about the same amount of time that the Bixby families combined lived in the 
in the house. But outside of our rancho, the tenant period doesn't exist, basically corresponds to the progressive era in, um, in American history, a period that was characterized by response to and reaction against the, the excesses, the, the corruption, the tremendous income uh, disparity that characterized the Gilded Age. So it was a period of, um, of workers struggle, um, work to uh, improve working conditions. Um, the women's suffrage movement was during this time. It was a time of um, just a surge in immigration to the US. The um, uh, first few years of the 20th century saw over a million immigrants per year enter our country. And, um, what has been called the first great wave of, of immigration. Uh, the second great wave being the one that we all have lived through at the um, second uh, latter part of the uh, 20th century. The progressive era was also characterized by advances in technology and transportation. It began with the horse and buggy and ended with the, um, uh, with the airplane. Uh, South of the border, events were contributing to um, immigration north as well. The Mexican Revolution was going on between 1810 and 1820, uh, led by um, Emiliano Zapata leading the rebel forces in the south, and Pancho Villa, who's featured uh, here on the right, um, leading forces up in the north. And the social unrest that accompanied this um, uh, 10 years of uh, fighting um, propelled immigration north into the Southwest um, states of the United States where the workers um, found work in agriculture as uh, farm workers on the railroads, uh, railroad maintenance and uh, construction, um, contract labor in the um, cities, largely in non-union uh, work conditions, and when they were um, permitted to join unions, typically in segregated unions, and for um, wages that were lower than those of their um, white counterparts. Um, Lisbeth Haas was um, uh, conducted uh, studies in uh, Orange County during uh, studying about the same period. And she um, reminds us that at that time, the use of the term Mexican or Mexican population, in fact, included a very diverse uh, population that included Californios, or in other words, people who had been living in California, whose families had lived in California for several generations since the Spanish colonial period and even before Mexico existed as a country. And it also included um, California Indians that with Spanish surnames. And so that to have this blanket term Mexican for the diverse population, in fact, tends to make invisible that continued presence of the indigenous peoples, um, not only at the Rancho, but in, uh, in Southern California. Um, I think an example of the, this use of the term can be found in our um, beloved Adobe days, where um, when Sarah talks about the arrival of the sheep shearers, and she describes their arrival as a gay band of Mexicans who arrived on their prancing horses. And we wanna remember that probably the majority of the, those workers were indigenous and California workers. I think a number of you are um, familiar with the work of Jacob Rees. He, he um, was a reformer who um, took groundbreaking photographs of the uh, living conditions in tenements of New York. And these were published in a book in 1890 called How the Other Half Lives. And the, the pictures of the overcrowded living conditions sparked uh, reform. Well, he had the opportunity to come to Los Angeles in 1912. And um, Rios Bustamante and Castillo ref describe Reese's uh, reference to the housing conditions, primarily of the uh, Mexican population in Los Angeles. 
as comparable to the worst tenements of Manhattan that he had seen. He was referring primarily to house courts. These were um, two rows of rooms that opened up onto an open courtyard in the middle where there was a water spigot and an outhouse that were shared by all of the families in the court. Um, and I, I mean families, each room, often rooms that had no windows were occupied by a different family. So all of these trends that I've just <laughs> talked about very briefly, the um, in urbanization, immigration, advances in technology, the housing and work conditions that were available to Mexican and Mex Mexican American workers, and the, this diversity of the population. All of these trends are reflected in the Rancho stories. And so, you know, I invite you to, you know, kind of keep these in mind as we move to look at what was going on at the Rancho. Um, the sheep ranching didn't stop the moment that Joe the Bixby and his family moved away. Um, that the ranching operations continued on. Uh, George H. Um, stayed uh, uh, as manager of the ranch until 1890 when he moved to his home on La Linda Drive, not far away. But um, in her monograph, Iris Engstrand, um, states that this period saw um, financial difficulties for the um, Flint Bixby company. Some of the, their investments were not as financially um, uh, viable as they once had been, the stagecoach line, their investment in, in sugar beet production. And so the decision was made to sell or lease parcels of Rancho uh, property. Um, and some of these parcels then became um, the cities um, that grew up on uh, Rancho Land, Long Beach, Clearwater, that became Paramount, Signal Hill, Bellflower, uh, and Lakewood. Um, and Long Beach was marketed as a seaside resort at this time uh, and saw a tremendous uh, population surge. Um, this was the time when the uh, the plunge was um, was built, the pier, the pike, and Clarinda Bustamante Carter describes what going to the beach was like in those early years. She says mother rented a little wagon and the whole family got inside. In those days, they had about fifteen or twenty wagons there, and you could rent them for ten cents a piece for two hours. You ran them out in the water, and they had kind of a cover on the wheels. And you had your bathhouse right there and nobody would see you because in those days, the women never showed their bare legs. Another one of the parcels um, ended up at, uh, under the initiative of um, Earl Dougherty, um, ended up as the uh, first inland airstrip in Long Beach. Alfred Valenzuela described how this came about. He said, my dad had the ground leased and he used to run cattle on Will Willow and Long Beach Boulevard. So Dougherty says, I'll give you so much for the lease, Paul. And then he says, well, I'll sell it to you. And he gave him so much. He says, I want you to clear the land for me so I can put my airport in there. You can clean it out with horses, you know. And to me, this idea of an airstrip being cleared out by horses is kind of shows the, the um, contradictions of this uh, t uh, tenant period. The map here on the, on the right shows the Bixby Knolls area um, during the 20s. Um, the Adobe house is right here. This is Long Beach Boulevard and then Bixby Road. And so Dougherty's airfield uh, was established in, 18, in 1919, right there on the corner of Long Beach Boulevard and Bixby Road, and existed there until it, was, until it moved in 1924 to where the municipal airport is today. But this map also shows some of the other parcels, the ranches that were still in operation during the, during the 20s. The Mitchell Andrews Ranch, uh, up here in the north. This is the one that's um, in the photograph that you see there. That was a, a dairy uh, dairy ranch, and they had a cheese factory up there. 
Um, the King Ranch down here, the Wardlow Ranch on Wardlow Road. And then right where Bixby Knowles is was the, the Bean Ranch. Aurelio Arias uh, contributed a written memoir that's in our archives. His family was one of the ones that came up from Mexico during the period of the revolution when Aurelio was a small boy. And he described um, the families arriving in the, uh, in the area and looking for work. He said, we lived for a few months at the Hickok farm. There were about six families living in one barn. It was converted into a shelter for all of us. We lived in the winter in the crowded barn and in the spring and summer, we lived in a tent on the Davis farm. Well, how about at the adobe itself? The, um, the photograph there on the left shows the adobe during the 1890s. So this is um, maybe 12, 10, 12, maybe 15 years after Jotham Bixby and his family had moved out. And you can see that, you know, the house has not been regularly whitewashed. And so the um, decay is, um, is already starting. Um, between 1894 and 1906, William Boyle ran a, a dairy operation at the, uh, at the ranch house. He had 150 cows and employed about a half a dozen milkers, one of whom was Bert Carter, who then married uh, Clenina Bustamante, who we heard out uh, from earlier. When the dairy operation uh, moved to a new location eastward, um, later tenants at the, uh, in the house said that um, the, what we refer to as the work wings were completely empty, just dirt floors. And I know that the picture here is dark on the right, but perhaps you recognize uh, the room that uh, is depicted there. If you're thinking uh, blacksmith shop, uh, you'd be correct. Uh, all you see there is remnants of the forge. We have a timeline of residents, and I know that uh, Laura's been working on updating this timeline for us. Just a few of the um, tenants that are listed on the uh, uh, timeline include Juan Lopez, uh, lived for um, about seven years. He was the foreman of a crew of Mexican workers who um, were contracted out for a variety of jobs, um, often uh, doing what's called topping the sugar beets. Uh, on the left, the Ricketts family is, uh, appears in that photograph. They were um, spent a couple of years at the rancho and one of their children was actually born at the, um, at the ranch house. Um, during the, uh, between 1910 and 1919, Ramona Lopez Garcia ran a boarding house on the second floor of the, of the Adobe house. And the, She's pictured in the photograph there on the right. She's the one on the horse. Uh, and the note in the archives says that the family members who donated the photo didn't know who the other two people were. And they believed that this photo was taken at the pike. Um, Alfonso de Cigarán um, did contribute an, uh, an interview. He was up almost, uh, almost 90 years old when he was interviewed. And he described living in the rancho during this, this time. He came and originally stayed with a relative of his, um, Bill Lurg, whose family was um, living in the master bedroom. Alfonso, the first, um, when he first arrived, slept on a pallet in the corner of the room. And then later he and his wife occupied what he called, he referred to as the little girl's bedroom. So I'm not, I'm not real sure which room that might have been, but we see that same pattern of, you know, one family per, per room of the house. The, the tenant who was probably the longest at the rancho was Miguel Murillo, um, who was referred to as Uncle Mike by um, his relative, uh, Julia Murillo Coronado, who was Concepcion's mother. And so then all of Julia's children also called him Uncle Mike. Um, Uncle Mike was born in 1830. And he said that he started breaking horses and working as a ranch hand when he was 14 years old at the rancho. Um, 
So we assume that he was um, working at the rancho when it was a cattle ranch under John Temple. Although when his, um, when his family members were asked if he talked about working under Temple, they said, well, he never, he might have worked for him, but he never mentioned it. He only ever talked about Mr. Bixby. Um, Mike passed away in 1931. So he himself didn't uh, participate in an oral interview, but he's mentioned in um, most of the other uh, oral interviews that we have. He was referred to as the old Indian. Uh, he had both California and Cahuila ancestry. And um, we recently received um, ancestor ancestry.com documents from uh, uh, the Liera family um, descendants. And these documents show that the Murillo, or it's sometimes spelled Morillo in the older in the older documents, um, it intermarried with the Cañedo families, that their ancestry dates back to the 1780s. In other words, those early years of the mission archives. Um, Uncle Mike married an indigenous woman, Antonia Silvas. She was of the Sovova band of Luiseno uh, Indians. And he was a storyteller extraordinaire. And so just in a couple of minutes, I'd like to share a few of his uh, stories with you. But he, um, in 1921, he moved out and he told his, his relative, Julia, about he, uh, that she should come, she should bring her family to live in the, in the adobe. And so she did. Um, she and her husband, Luis, and their um, seven children occupied the half of the two-story adobe. They, they occupied the north half of the two-story part of the house. And the Torres Liera family occupied the south half. Um, I think we, I think it, we've all heard the stories of um, the wedding of Manuel Liera and Concepcion Coronado. She, she says that she, she met uh, Manuel when she was well. Actually, she said she was nine years old, but I believe she was thirteen years old. Um, it was her job to go to the Virginia Country Club and bring back water in a pail. And that was when she first saw um, uh, her, Manuel, her, her future husband. Um, her brother, Frank, whom we'll hear from in just a moment, um, uh, conducted an interview at the, um, at the ranch house. And he was up on the balcony that overlooks what's now the um, 1930s great room. And he said, this was, this was where their um, wedding party took place. He said, the old timers called that room Temple Salon de Baile or ballroom. And, and then he kind of shook his head and lamented the fact that it, it didn't exist anymore. It had been taken out to make that high ceiling. Um, the both um, Concepcion's father and her brother Frank, as well as Manuel, worked at Virginia Country Club. And I don't know if you can see it on your screens, but this uh, in the center photograph, this is on the left is the is the adobe, and this is probably right around 1921. Um, this is the uh, Rancho Adobe. The trees in the back garden, no no fence or anything. Oops. Ah. Sorry about that. Uh, and then this is the Virginia Country Club, uh, isolated out there when the uh, they uh, was first built. This is another a uh, little bit later photograph that shows the adobe over here um, in the corner. The Virginia Country Club. And this photograph also shows this area up here is the um, LA River and shows how close the river was to the to the adobe. And all of this is um, are willow trees. And all of the um, in all of the interviews, they discuss the um, uh, the willow trees that lined the river at that time. This photograph um, on the left shows the ranch house as it appeared in the 1920s. And we see even more um, deterioration at this time. The photo, the photo also shows the, um, the outhouse 
that the family used. They they described it as a six seat outhouse. Um, and then both the um, Liera and the uh, Coronado families uh, uh, raised chickens as well as raising vegetables out in the garden. And in one of the in one of their interviews. Um, Manuel and Concepcion have a, a kind of a joking story about how the how the chickens were participants in their wedding uh, party, um, and Manuel says, "Yeah, they sacrificed themselves for the chicken enchiladas that um, uh, Concepcion's mother prepared for the guests." Um, in all of the interviews, I don't think I've found any. Any words of complaint or bemoaning uh, of the fact that um, they were living in a home that, as we look at it today, is a home that was falling into disrepair. Rather, the um, the interviewees were very um, matter of fact, accepting, and moving forward with their lives. One one example is. Um, when they were talking about um, their um, health and home remedies, and they were um, the Lieras were asked um, if they saw a doctor, and they said, "Well, we we called the doctor when um, Concepcion was ready to give birth, but the doctor didn't arrive in time, and so Manuel delivered the baby." And the the interviewer asks Concepcion, "Weren't you afraid?" And Concepcion says, "No." I wasn't afraid at all. So this is the spirit of the tenants uh, living in those days. Well, I'm sure that Uncle Mike continued to visit the ranch after he moved out. And this is a picture of Uncle Mike talking, the note in the archive says it's an unnamed woman. Um, but Virginia um, Coronado Babcock kind of sets the scene for uh, Uncle Mike's storytelling. She says, I could still see, we used to sit back here. There used to be a big rose bush back here and we'd sit out here with him and he'd tell us all these crazy stories about the ghosts. And then we'd go out in front and he'd roll his own cigarettes, you know? He'd roll his own cigarettes and he'd smoke a whole little sack of tobacco telling us all these crazy ghost stories. So he used to tell stories of the ghost horses, which I think is very fitting uh, as a vaquero that there would be ghost horses. Um, he used to tell them not to go beyond where the riverbed used to be. There was used to be a big bridge over the riverbed and he told us never to go by that bridge or to go over the bridge at five o'clock because a herd of horses will come through. And he says, you can't see them, but you can hear them, but you'll never be able to get out of their way. And she says, so we would never go over the bridge at a certain time. She. Virginia turns out was quite the enterprising young woman. She, she points to the gate in the courtyard and she said it used to swing out and there'd be people come through here and we charge them a quarter. We take them all through the house and we tell them to be very quiet because the ghost didn't like to be disturbed. So we made money off them. All day there'd be people coming here and we charge them to come in and then my dad would come home and he'd find out what we pulled. Oh, he'd give us the devil. Now her brother Frank kind of offers a different perspective. He says, dad used to say, he was skeptical. Yeah, there's no such thing, Mike. And Mike would say, oh yes, I seen it with my own eyes. And he wasn't a drinking man. So you know, there was something to it. We used to kid him about it. And he was very serious and sincere about these things. I used to talk to my uncle Mike. He told us some wonderful stories. They're kind of scary about the wild horses and the ghost-like things that used to happen in long ago days. Um, I don't know if you knew that the rancho had a dungeon. According to Virginia, um, she was talking about the work wing and she says there's a garage in one of the rooms and the next room to it had a stairway going down into the, we used to call it the dungeon. There were chains on the wall with the cuffs and they had, I remember shackles like leg shackles. And we were down there just once because my uncle said that if we ever went in there, we wouldn't be able to get out because the ghosts would close that door and there we would be stuck in there, you know. 
And then there, there are a number of stories of treasure uh, in the, um, uh, at the rancho. Uh, Concepcion told the story of her mother finding pe pennies in a tobacco sack in the old adobe ruin. And this was the Cota adobe that she was talking about. The Cota adobe was the original adobe that had been built by um, Manuela uh, Nieto and her husband Guillermo Cota when they uh, received the Rancho Los Ritos. And it, it, during Temple's time and, and the uh, Bixby, time that um, house wasn't used uh, and fell into disrepair. Um, Sarah, it's the house that Sarah refers to as the flea house in, in uh, Adobe days. And the note in our archives says that this, this photo is probably a photo of, we're not sure, but probably a photo of the Cota Adobe as it appeared during the tenant period. So Concepcion says that her mother said that the sack was full and she ran to her godmother and said, look, mother, she called her godmother, mother, look what I found. And she said, oh, give me that child. Give me that. There's pennies in there. My mother gave them to her. And later we learned that they were $20 gold pieces. And in another version of the story, they were $5 gold pieces. Both of the girls um, talk about um, finding coins in the walls of the adobe as well, that they would scratch on the walls and occasionally they'd find coins. Um, the final story I'd like to share is um, one, this is Frank Coronado pictured there on the left. And this is a story of the three silver ingots that Uncle Mike had. And there's a story of how he got the silver ingots. But then he says, Uncle Mike brought these three big chunks of silver and they were laying around there. And he kept stumbling into them all the time. And then he took them down into this bottomless well and chucked them in there. And they're still there. Nobody ever found them. There was many a try made. They tried countless people, adventurers, heard about the treasures of the Cerritos Rancho. The hillside was always dug up, but to a certain extent, they dug in the wrong places. So where is it buried? He wouldn't tell anybody. And neither would the rest of the family that had any money. So there is a treasure. It's never been discovered, but somebody might. And so I'm holding out the hope that when they're digging for the cistern in July, that they might find these three silver ingots that, uh, that Uncle Mike tossed in the bottomless well. Um, I've been thinking about the stories from the archives and I, I feel that um, it's, it might be easy for us to look at the pictures of the house and it looks to be in disrepair and, and we see only that, that house. But as the people tell the stories, we see that it's also a house where they live alongside ghosts and it's a place of imagination and a, and a place of possibility where, who knows, treasure could be found. This last picture is a picture of um, Manuel and Concepcion as they're doing, I think this is the interview that they did in the early 90s. You can tell that they're there in the library. Uh, Frank said, uh, when I retire, I'd like to write a book about the things I know. I would remember a lot because those things die. You have to have somebody start that little ember that burns a little bit, start it up again, and you start remembering those things. And so I think those of us who are volunteers at the Rancho now can thank those, um, the curators and the volunteers who, who came before, who conducted these interviews and, and transcribed them, kept the em embers burning uh, for us to um, continue to enjoy to today. So I thank you for your um, attention. I'm gonna stop the sharing and uh, go back to um, uh, coming back together. And I don't know if there's um, comments uh, that others have made or, or possible questions. We might have a couple minutes. Well, there's a lot of comments from staff about where we might look for the gold ingots. <laughs> Apparently, Allison wants to finance the barn or something with those. Maybe it would work. <laughs> I, I hope we find them. <laughs>
so um, I, and comments on a wonderful presentation, which is fabulous. We are opening it up for questions. We have uh, Marsha with her hand raised. So I'm going to click on yours to allow you to talk, Marsha, and you can ask Lord, uh, Leslie your question. The moms with long term yes. sons. Hello? Whatever you want to call it. And then the music. I can't hear you because I have a medical thing going on, but. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Did I do it right? I know I I know I would have been okay. Well, I hope I would have been okay. So Marsha, I'm gonna mute you until you figure it out. Um that maybe how I, mean, that... I know I come off the screen. That's another thing that's dangerous. Are you asking me to unmute or what are you asking me? Do you have your hand raised? Did you have a question for Leslie? No, I didn't, it's not something. I don't know what's going on. I can't see. I can't see, so I don't know what's going on. I'm okay. just listening to the program on the on the telephone. Uh, we have another comment that says the gold isn't hidden. It walks around every day, loving and sharing the RLC. So I'm guessing that's the visitors. We do have a question um, from YouTube specifically about the dungeon um, and like where where it would be located um, and asking if there's any records of people who were put in there and what the reasons might have been for people to be put in the dungeon. Um, so um, first of all, I think Alana, you know more about the dungeon than than I do because a few months ago you took us into the um, the basement on the other side, um, on the south side of the the um, uh, on the south side of the Adobe. Um, I don't know that it was a dungeon, um, and I I guess my feeling is um, that whether it was or wasn't a dungeon is not so important as the fact that for the people living there they were ready to believe that yes, they saw chains and so they they thought it was a dungeon. So I I don't have really any more information about the fact, except that there is a basement there and there's a there's a trap door, I think kind of in front of Alfred's office. <laughs> um, is that but correct? Those are from the 1930s though. So those might be a different uh, a, a different undertaking. But, um, but there is, sorry to jump in, we, uh, a few months ago, we had um, Gerard who helped with our digitization present. And so we do have through, it's hosted through the Cal State Dominguez Hills website. Some of the oral histories are available. And so um, this is Virginia Coronado Babcock is the one who was sharing this. And she does, there is a, there's a little bit longer story about it. Um, so it still isn't totally clear where it would be or exactly what it looked like, but her, the interpretations that they had and more about um, kind of where it might have been located. So for people who are really interested in the dungeon, you can um, check that oral history out. The full oral history is only about 20 minutes, I believe, and that the dungeon is right at the beginning of it. Somebody wants to know if there's chains in the collection. <laughs> uh, no, uh, you know, the chains also appear in the ghost stories. Um, people hear uh, Uncle Mike talked about the chains being dragged up the uh, up the steps of the of the house and that you could hear the the chains. So uh, I don't know, you know, uh, if what really what was uh, what was down there. Alana, do, could what you? Was your, what's your favorite story, Leslie? Um, I don't know. I, um, I guess my favorite one really was um, when Frank talked about his dad and his dad saying, "Ah, oh, Mike, that that didn't happen," and and Uncle Mike's 
insistence that yes, I saw it, and I'm I'm telling this um, I'm telling this this story. So these were not not fantastical tales that were told about others, but they were very personal stories that he saw, he saw and he experienced. And so I um, think I enjoyed that. Um, Someone asked if you would clarify two families living upstairs, no one downstairs. Um, the I believe the um, the Quinanalo family lived they where the dining room is today was there um, when she was um, asked about it, uh, Concepcion said, um, she was asked if that was the dining room. And she said, well, yes, but more like a living room. She said that we, we didn't have a sofa, but we had benches and that's where the family gathered. And then they used the, the bedrooms upstairs. On the other side, there's um, reference to the Torres family downstairs. And Mrs. Liera's maiden name was Torres. So I think that they were living there. And then when Manuel and Concepcion um, uh, got married, his parents were upstairs and they moved out and the Manuel and Concepcion lived uh, upstairs. And Manuel went ahead and built a wooden sink for Concepcion so that she could cook. Uh, she could have her kitchen area upstairs um, on the south side of the of the house. So there seemed to be a kitchen on either end, right, for different yeah. families. Yeah, Concepcion said that her mother had, um, she was asked if, Concepcion was asked if she baked and she said, well, she didn't have an oven. And so I assume that she had kind of like a, probably a kerosene stove. So she could, she could prepare food. She said, my mother had, had an oven and she was the one who baked. Leslie, thank you so much for expanding our understanding of the Rancho and sharing uh, your passion and the fruits of your labor, uh, digging into those archives. I think a lot of the photos are new for people as well. Some of them were new to me when I first got to see the exhibit. Um, so I'm imagining there's even more and more exciting photos uh, to come maybe, but these are wonderful um, as well as the stories. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Huge round of applause. Uh, next up is Carlos, who is going to tell us um, about an event coming up on June 4th and 5th. All right. Thank you all very much for uh, being here today. Um, and thank you, uh, Leslie, for a wonderful insight into the, that important time, time period and history of the Rancho. Um, so I'm, I'm here to give you a little bit more information about uh, the Getty Center, the Getty Festival. So the Getty Center up on the 405 is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. And they are, partner, they are partnering with community groups across LA to, do, to launch a different series of free outdoor community festivals. They're doing one in Inglewood, another one is in East LA, a third one in Koreatown, you have Pacoima, San Gabriel Valley, Wilmington, Crenshaw, Watts, and Long Beach. And the one that they're doing for Long Beach, it's in H H Houghton Park, Houghton Park? Um, just 10 minutes from uh, the Rancho, and it takes place on June 4th and 5th. And that's between 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. And the Getty organizers asked Rancho Los Cerritos to lead uh, the creation of an art exhibition. And um, that's what we're doing for that festival on June 4th and 5th. Um, the goal of those festivals is to celebrate the joy of art through Los Angeles and um, the exhibition that the Rancho will be creating for them is um, 
an extension um, of our current exhibition, Roots in California, Concepts of Home. So we are calling the exhibition we will have at the festival, Roots in Long Beach, Concepts of Home. And it will be divided in three different spaces. And each space is outdoors. And each space will have uh, two to three artists that they will highlight alternative views of home and um, the sections will be is home people and in that you the artists are planning to we have painters and photographers and they're having portraits of the wide diversity of people living in Long Beach we have a section called is home place where Gloria Sanchez the artist who developed for us the living room space she will be leading that area and she's going to create a throne uh, that will showcase all the landmarks in Long Beach and the ancestry that relates to Long Beach. And they will have a throne in the middle of the space where visitors can sit in and take photographs in. And the last section is titled Is Home Memory? And that goes back to events that happened uh, not that long ago that relates to the Black Lives Matter and the Pride movement. And um, so um, I've been told by the Getty organizers that the Getty trustees will only be visiting one of the festivals and that festival is the one in Long Beach. There are we are expecting to have um, 10,000 visitors over the course of two days. So it's going to be crowded. There's, it's a huge park. They're having vendors. They have two stages with live music, poetry reading. There is a huge installation by the Getty with 20 TVs where they're going to be highlighting their collection. We have the presence of the Long Beach Museum of Art as well and we have the presence of Rancho Los Cerritos. <laughs> so we not only we're going to be uh, in that space, but also we will have a booth. Um, so I know that Laura has uh, already planned on Volkistics, and we are hoping uh, to count on your um, help to represent the rancho in, in front of the community and also in front of those Getty trustees. Um, um, Laura has scheduled for Sunday uh, between the hours of 10.30 and 2 p.m. or 2 and 6 p.m. And the information, you can reach out to her for further details. Also, since this is a community project, we will be helping the artists to install and deinstall their art. So if you feel um, inspired and want to learn more about those artists participating and help us install the exhibition, you can do so. It's also on logistics. We will be installing Friday, June 3rd, between 9 and a.m. and 6 p.m. And Laura has also divided that into different shifts. So. Um, and also we will need some help with the deinstallation the last day on Sunday, but that'll be a lot faster. It'll be just for two hours uh, in the evening. But um, that said, I think it's a terrific opportunity to show the community that we are here, that we are part of an important part of Long Beach history. And also they'll be able to see the, the wide variety of artists and stories that we bring to the table. And so that's all. Thank you very much. Carlos, someone asked if all the artists have been selected. Yes, so we have so far eight artists confirmed and two pending. Um, they're all pretty much all except two local uh, Long Beach artists. We have, uh, let me pull, well, um, they, come from different communities. So we have a Cambodian representation, Vietnamese, um, uh, Mexican, American representation, 
through an artist called Narciso Martinez, who um, creates art on uh, boxes, uh, fruit boxes. And he always brings up issues of um, the treatment of employees on the fields. And uh, we are going to have a Tonga uh, representation, although it hasn't been fully confirmed, but um, we have Mercedes Dorame, who is uh, an artist who recently did an installation uh, in a park and she's collaborating with the Getty in a future project. And uh, we have a photographer called Well Done uh, Spurg Spur Spurgling, and um, who has been taking photos for the last 20 years of people um, in Long Beach. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, a wide, it's a big variety. And each section, the idea is that people will be able to take photographs in the space and also see themselves reflected. So there'll be some historical mirrors, not from our collection, but uh, on loan. <laughs> and, um, and anyways, it's a great opportunity. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Marie, I think you're up. And just unmute yourself. Hover, hover over the bottom left corner and you'll probably see the mute. Can you see my screen? All right, so in 2000s, in the mid 2000s, the Natural History Museum started doing bio blitzes. And what a bio blitz is, is a opportunity for typical everyday people to go out and try to find as many different kinds of wildlife in a designated area as possible. This was a huge success. And by 2016, they had the idea of talking to San Francisco, the California Academy of Sciences, and say, why don't we try doing this as a competition? You do the Bay Area, we do LA, and we'll see how many kinds of wildlife we can find in an urban setting. You, typically, they'd been going up into the mountains, going to the deserts, going to the ocean, but this would be an urban center. And sad to say, San Francisco beat our butts. But the following year, it generated so much interest that instead of just two cities, it was 16 cities. And the following year, it went national. And the year after that, international. So today, this is a global, a, a global initiative. And you can see to, that we had 47 countries. You can see my, my um, cursor. 47 countries participated this year. Well, the Rancho participated last year and we just used a few volunteers and I wanted to grow it this year. We knew we were not doing big programming. So we didn't do a big PR push, but we did go to you, our volunteers, and ask for help. And once again, some of these trusty volunteers showed up and they were willing to look for birds and to look for critters and insects and what have you. And those that participated say they had a lot of fun. Los Angeles County did this for four days. The rancho only did it for three. But you can see these numbers of what the, what the observations were, the species, and how many people participated. When I wanted to grow it this year, one of the ways that I did this was to invite them to a reservation only 
black light event. And I want to thank Donald Spector for this photograph. This was something where entomologists came with black lights and white sheets. We dimmed the rancho lights and we got to see insects that we would normally not be seeing because they're attracted, they're nocturnal. They're attracted to the lights thinking that they might be the moon uh, reflected on a white sheet. And we had an opportunity to take a look and see who they were. Well, I can tell you that the Rancho wound up with 608 observations. And if you look at this graph, this little circle, that, that the part that is green, those are observations that have been confirmed, their identity has been confirmed. This yellow section means that our numbers could go up as far as species count, because these are still waiting identification. But the, the numbers that did come in show that the, uh, the creatures that we saw absolutely the most of were insects, which makes sense because there are more insects on, in the earth, planet Earth than any other kind of category of creature. So we had bees and wasps and flies and butterflies and moths, beetles and praying mantises and some really weird soil web worms and a couple of mollusks. And many of these were creatures that I still don't know who they are. They still haven't been identified, some of them. And to me, that's kind of cool that we're still working on learning who is at the rancho. The second category that came up big were birds. And we all know, anybody who listens to Marie knows that the rancho has a lot of birds. Well, the Natural History Museum times this event so that we have spring migration going on. And in spring migration, all these birds are coming through the Pacific Flyway. And they're coming right over the rancho. And well, it's not a good photograph. Uh, this particular bird that my cursor is moving on right now, <clears throat> is a McGilvery's warbler. And it is the first record that the rancho has of a McGilvery's warbler on site. So not only did we count a lot of birds, we were able to increase the number of birds that we know that come through and visit the rancho. Uh, when I presented to the board, they said, what was the strangest thing that you found? Which I hadn't really thought about. But my selection was this weird thing called an amphipod. And it is very tiny. We're talking millimeters here. This is my little finger. This fleshy part here is the middle finger, my little finger. And this little tiny creature is sort of like a shrimp, very soft bodied, has little carapace, and it feeds on detritus in the pond. Have no idea how it got here how long they've been living here, but this is the first time that I've seen them. Um, one of the things that we want to show for the Rancho is how can we expand how the Rancho is used and what value by having events like this does the Rancho provide to the greater community? So I broke out this quick graph to show how many observation LA County had in four days, how many, num what the numbers were for the Rancho in three days, and the percentage that the Rancho netted for LA County. And on observations, we were over 3% of all observations made in LA County came from the Rancho. And on the species count, over six and a third of the species counted throughout LA County were in fact counted at Rancho Los Cerritos. A historic site, we're talking less than five acres. We had only 14 people. And look at what these amazing volunteers accomplished. Who were the volunteers that many of you might know? Well, we had Toby Near, Laura Breen, Joyce Sherado, Gregory Jeffers, and Donald Specker. And I have to tell you, some of these people brought in friends, which helped boost our numbers and boost our observations. Uh, 
so this was a real treat and a real joy. I'm hoping to grow it bigger next year. To do that, I will probably need help. So you'll be getting another email blast from me probably in March, April going, help, Re wants to count critters. But I wanted to share with you some of the craziness that we accomplished here at the Rancho, but the value of what citizen science can actually do, not just for the Rancho, not just for the County of LA, or to strengthen our partnership with the Natural History Museum, but this is global. So people are looking at our numbers and our observations in an international forum. And I thought that might be interesting to you. So that ends my presentation. All right, so that means it's time for me to talk to you all about summer camp. And I do have uh, just a little visual to be playing hopefully without sound. Yes, just behind me while I speak. Um, so it's almost summer, which means it's almost time for summer camps. And as Allison mentioned, um, we we have been selling um, registrations. They've been filling up. So Nature Camp is almost completely sold out. Um, there are still spaces available in each of the camps, but that one is um, the closest to filling up. Um, our summer camps are engaging and fun, but they also are inspired by the history uh, of the site and the gardens as well. So we have four total weeks of summer camp. Each week is its own session. Three of them are for elementary school and one is for middle school. And so they begin the, <coughs> excuse me, the week of July 18th. And so that first week is called Time Travelers Camp. It's for elementary school. Each day of camp explores a different part of the rancho's history and compares the art, the science and technology, the games and some of the food of each of those different time periods. Uh, the second week is Nature Camp, which is really drawing inspiration from the beautiful and historic grounds uh, upon which camp takes place. So that is building with natural materials, painting what you see around you in the gardens, using natural materials to create art. And that one is also for elementary school. Our third session is called Vaquero Camp. Mm -hmm. And in that one, we take a deep dive into the the cattle ranching part of the rancho history. Um, so a lot of activities that are what people would have been doing in the 1840s and 50s, um, some cattle roping practice without real cows, but um, they still get to practice some roping. Um, and then other um, activities that draw from Mexican culture because in 1844, the land we are on was part of Mexico. And then our final session is for middle schoolers and it's called Unplugged because their kids are taken away from all of their devices and tablets and computers. And that again is going to look at the full Rancho history, um, but then specifically looking at the Victorian era and some of those like technological and science advancements that are happening. So it's STEAM, science technology, what is it, Eng engineering, art, and math, but in the 19th century. So what the modern technology looked like at that time. So that's our middle school camp. All of the camps run from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And um, they are all uh, $175 per week. And if you are a member, you have a discount. And so it comes, it brings it to $150 per week. And we do have scholarships that are available on a first come first serve basis. So if you want to learn more about camps, you can ask me, Alana, um, or you can visit our website. Um, you can do ranchalosoritos.org slash camp and it will take you. And um, you can also feel free to reach out to me with any questions questions. It'll give you a little more information about the camps as well as take you to the registration page. Um, and if you want to um, sign up or sorry, if you want to apply for a scholarship, you can also contact me for that. So these pictures show um, there's a lot of fun, you know, bonding. Uh, we do need um, volunteers as well to be camp counselors. So if you know anyone that's interested, have them contact me as well. So for all your camp needs, contact Alana and then I should have answers for you. You can see, it's so much fun. We had the best time. 
you should send your kids slash grandkids slash children that you know to Rancho Los Cerritos camps. And I believe Andreina is next. All right. Thank you, Alana. Hi, everyone. My name is Andreina Juarez. I'm the development associate here at Rancho Los Cerritos. I just want to share with you all that Rancho Los Cerritos is starting a Spanish language docent training. It will run every Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. for seven weeks, beginning Saturday, June 25th to August 6th. This course will be um, taking place in the library in person, and it will also be conducted in Spanish. So this docent program was developed by our two DEIA committee member volunteers, Leslie, who just presented earlier today, and Giovanna in 2021. So, um, and this course will also be led by Leslie and myself. So the format of these tours and trainings will be slightly different from our traditional tours and docent trainings. If we're going to incorporate the California Native Garden and proceed into the 1844 Adobe home. And the presentation, as well as a docent training, will be more of a conversational style rather than a lecture based. So please help spread the word to any Spanish speakers who might be interested in this training program. They could contact me and we'll share a flyer afterwards. Thank you. I think I'm up now and um, thank you volunteers for being here. It's good to see everybody. I loved Leslie's uh, presentation and to the end of growing our ranks, we are having a new volunteer open house this very coming Saturday at the Rancho at 11 o'clock. So if you know anybody that you think might like to get involved with the Rancho, this would be a great time to come and find out what we're all about and be introduced to volunteering. We'd love to have you, have your friends or family or whoever. And also very important for all of the public hours volunteers, everybody who volunteers for public hours, including uh, the house docents, the garden docents and the people that just are the greeters and the wayfinders. We are having our annual updates meeting where you can learn what's new things happening with public hours and just a refresher on everything we do. And there's going to be some fun new developments. And that's going to be virtually on June 8th at five o'clock. And it will be, we hope you can come. So you can ask questions and find out firsthand, but it will be recorded if you can't come so that you can see it later. And now it's time to check in with you and see how everybody is. So hold tight while we promote you to be panelists and we'll be back with the check-in question. Does it seem like you've promoted everybody you can? I'm still working on it. It seems like they all won't promote. They can always put their comments in. Well, since we are have been talking about home for uh, with the new exhibit and uh, the home that the tenants called the Rancho, uh, Megan had the great idea that we could share where was your first home away from uh, the home that you grew up in. 
So <laughs> I see some people with looks on their face like, oh, does my memory go back that far? Well, mine does. And my first home was in Belmont Shore, uh, 32 Argonne, and an upstairs uh, Spanish style apartment building, which is no longer there. <clears throat> and I lived with uh, two waitresses that uh, I worked with at the park pantry. And Megan suggested that we maybe think of a funny story. I can't really remember so much from those days, but I do remember one kind of funny story. I was a pretty naive young woman. And uh, when our porch light burned out, I happened to have a red light bulb. And I thought it would be very festive to put that in our porch light. But um, some people let me know that that might not be a good idea for three young ladies to have a red light bulb on their porch. So I took it down and I learned something, but that there's something called a red light district. So. It was quite a learning experience for me. Anyways, so we'll do the pass the mic where I will pass it on to somebody and you will share that those sort of memories from your life or if you can't think of anything, whatever it is you would like to share with us. And then you will pick somebody to pass it on to. And I am going to pass it on to the person who shares the same beautiful first name as I. I'm so happy to see her here today, coming from her new home in Seal Beach. That's you, Laura. Unmute yourself. All right, uh, let's see. My first home, I guess beyond college, I don't know if you call college a home or not, but, um, was in a third story um, wooden building in a town called, um, oh, in Northern Wisconsin. And of course it was very cold and it had wooden stairs that went up to it to the third story. And in the winter, it was very slippery and very icy going up those wooden steps. Fortunately, I never fell down, but my mother came to visit me and she told me, we don't live in places like this. <laughs> so, so anyway, that was a story. I lived with two of my former college friends, both who had got married during the summer and all they wanted to talk about was their husbands and I didn't have a husband. So I had a very um, sort of nostalgic, sad time. Although my boyfriend did come to see me once, but he was in the army, so he wasn't there very much. But that was my first home. Very good. Who would you like to pass the mic to? Oh, uh, I don't know who's there. Who is there? Let's send it to Joy. Is she there? Um, I do see Joy and Hyam are on. You might share it in the chat, Lori. You might have to pick someone else. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> could I see the names again? Oh, there's Carlos and Leslie and Nancy, Marsha. Okay, Carlos. All right, so, you know, you mentioned college, but um, I, the last year of college, I actually um, went to Germany, to Berlin, and I studied there for a year and a half. And I remember that being the time, the first time where, I had nobody there to cook for me. <laughs> so I had to learn how to cook Spanish food while I was in Germany, which also was challenging in itself because, you know, the, the foods that we would eat 
and the fish and weren't the same. So I remember a time where I would call very often at a time where there were no cell phones. I would call home almost every day right, with a little notebook getting, you know, in the call of the day, just on the, in the telephone cabin uh, outside, writing down recipes on how to cook paella and how to cook ba Basque chicken and then um, struggling with it. I, it was a time of a, a lot of hunger for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me, let me pass it around. Um, Mark. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, uh, setting aside the homes that I occupied during my years at college and graduate school, um, my first home would have been a condo in the city of Stanton. And there's a story behind that. So um, my wife and I got engaged, got married at the ripe age of 22, literally right out of college. And we were looking for a place and they had some condominiums built in the city of Stanton that were available uh, for first time home buyers. But it was quite popular. And we ended up camping in a car in line for over a week so that we could be in line when these things finally went to sale. And the whole family chipped in. I spent time because if you got out of line, you lost your place. So Dad spent time in the line. My sister spent time in the line. My future wife spent time in the line. And I did. And we hung in there for the entire week. And luckily, we were able to purchase our first condominium at, at, uh, in the city of Stanton. But um, you haven't experienced anything until you spend an entire week waiting in line. I've done it for, for concert tickets, but never for a condo in the city of Stanton. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who would you like to pass on to? Uh, let's see, Thomas. Let's see, my first place away from home was uh, downtown in Long Beach on uh, 25 Falcon. And it was a, uh, a fourplex and um, the lady downstairs, I know she was a, a Navy nurse during World War II. She had all kinds of great stories during that time. She was a hoot. And we'd have barbecues there with the four families that lived there. Um, and we lived there for, gosh, five years. And uh, it was great just to listen to the foghorns at night and walk down to the beach. And um, it was great memories there. And uh, it was a real family. And I will always treasure those. So that was good old downtown Long Beach. And also the... Uh, the uh, Grand Prix was going on back then. So we could just walk over there and they had also, they have a band once a year, they'd have all these bands coming from all the schools and it'd be all down Falcon. So we'd beat up on the balcony watching down. So it's a lot of fun things going on. So I think I will pass this off to Nancy. Hello. Okay, unmuted. I'm unmuted. Yeah, unmuted. Well, I've been thinking about where that would be. I lived from home. I moved into the dormitories in college from a dormitory that I was married. <laughs> and so actually our first homes are the same after, after that. Um, but, but before that, uh, she, her father was, uh, was in the oil business and he, he would move from place to place. And so she occupied quite a few. Well, but after even after we were married, we lived first in an apartment for a few months, and then we moved into married student housing, and that's where our daughter was born, and then we graduated, and then moved to Seattle. For, yeah. and then we lived in one apartment, and then we bought a house. So that was our first house was in Seattle, where we lived barely long enough to hang the pictures on the wall, When then we moved down to Southern California, and We've been in our house here for in August, it will be 50 years. So this is home, yeah. <laughs> this is home. We kind of settled in. Yes, so. we have pictures on the wall, the whole thing, we're here forever yeah. until they carry us out. <laughs> but uh, no, we settled here in Huntington Beach. We love it, we love our neighborhood and a lot of us are original owners. So it gives, you know, we know each other's children, grandchildren and some 
great grandchildren. So yeah. great place to live. So now I will pass it to Gregory. Okay, well, um, I was born in Englewood, Colorado, and uh, the first place I moved out to was in uh, North um, Denver um, with my first love of my life, and uh, I was 17, but uh, the first home that I owned was here in Long Beach. It was um, a, over uh, Bixby Park, overlooking Bixby Park on Broadway and Cherry, um, I lived there for eight years. That's where uh, I buried my first two husbands. And uh, so, yeah, that was 1980s, late 80s, early 90s. So um, a funny story, not much funny stories. <laughs> I think uh, the funniest story was, uh, well, I, I, I painted the house that I first moved out of um, to be the same color as my parents' house. You know, and, and I put up a white picket fence because I wanted to have a white picket fence. So um, that was the pearl 17 year old. Okay, how about um, um, Adri Adrian Juarez? Adriana Juarez? Ah, close. Andrina. Andrina. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us and for all of you for sharing your uh, what home means to you. It's got me thinking as well of what home means to me. And as cheesy as this can, is, this is going to sound, but I would say city of Long Beach. I have, was not born and raised in Long Beach. I'm from Southeast LA in the little small town called Maywood. And so I grew up here, born and raised here, school here, everything was here. So when I went to school to Cal State Long Beach, that was kind of like my like first adventure outside of Southeast LA. And I fell in love with Long Beach. And then also um, my first job at Rancho Los Cerritos was another connection to Long Beach. And it just kind of pushed me to explore more of Long Beach. And I was like, yeah, I want to move here one day. So hopefully I'll actually get a home in Long Beach. But yeah, so that's my home away from home. And I'll choose, uh, let's see, Joyce and Martin. Uh -oh. I think the microphone isn't working. How about now? Can you hear us? Now we can. Great. Okay. You want to go first, Martin? Uh, sure. I'll, there's Martin. I'll go first, I guess. Um, uh, when I graduated college, I moved into Long Beach because it was central to the restaurant chain I was working for. And uh, they had restaurants in LA and Orange County. And Long Beach is kind of, well, technically in LA County, but it's pretty much in the middle, driving wise. And if any of you know of Banner Circle, not too far from the Rancho, it's at the uh, corner of Orange and San Antonio. And I lived behind the old Cloth World store, which I'm sure Laura Wilbanks knows about. Just a hunch. <laughs> anyway, I had a little one bedroom apartment that was a uh, good thing I was working 80 to 90 hours a week. It was just fine. That was it. Okay. And I'm glad I don't live there anymore. But it's still there. All right. So I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, the house that we grew up in was built in the around 1900. So um, and was divided into a fourplex during the uh, Depression. Um, so my bedroom was one of the four apartments. And it was the former dining room. And it was this beautiful built-in um, a buffet and all the walls were um uh, it was just it was just stunning so I, the dining room I lived in for the bedroom was just stunning so that's where I got my um appreciation for woodworking and for architecture um and then um um in college I went to move closer to UCLA and lived in um I guess the front of an apartment building where the owner should have lived. So there were three of us girls. We shared that huge apartment. Um, 
and it was on $99 a month. And so, so that was, that was it. Was it at 99? No. Okay. Yeah. No, it was only $99 a month. Um, and so it was fun to um, live in West Los Angeles uh, where it was safe to walk around. Um, and uh, from there, I um, then lived in Valencia, other parts of Los Angeles, and then finally moved to Long Beach after I met Martin. Let's see. So that's it. Um, no funny stories, huh? <laughs> no, we have no funny stories. So um, next person would be Marsha. It's funny that you asked this question because I was asking the doctor five minutes ago, what was the first phone number I had when I was little? I had Harrison 17919 on Josie Avenue in Long Beach. But um, I've been living in Long Beach almost all my life. Um, the first time I went away from that Josie house as a, I was a high school and went to Georgia to be a camp counselor. And the funny part is that the, I went, I, the, people lost my luggage, so I had to get things. And so I was going to go to the J.C. Penney's in, in, in um, we were in Cleveland, Georgia, so you had to get all the way to Atlanta. But um, they took me there and the layout was exactly the same as the Lakewood Center uh, Penny's was, except when I walked in there to ask for a bra, the lowest size they had was double D. So that was kind of funny to me. But um, I had to have it sent mailed from Long Beach to, to there because everybody there was so different. And the, the store layout was the same, but when you asked for help, it was, may I help you? A totally different accent. But then when I actually got married and was looking for a house, um, I called up where I'm living now in 1970s and said, um, do you have a fireplace? And the lady said, two. And I said, two. It was pouring rain. I said, let me go see. And I came here and I walked in the kitchen. There was a big wagon wheel and it was all like historically things that I would love. So I just said, okay, what are you going to do with the pool table that's in the middle? And she said, oh, I don't know how we're going to take that out. And I said, I'll buy it from you right now. And she, she was showing it to me, but her husband wasn't there. So I got a real good deal, but I didn't know it at the time. So, um, I've lived here ever since, and I'm planning to die in this house. Hopefully not real soon, but um, that's it. And passing around, I'm lucky I can see now. I couldn't see an hour ago, but I saw. I got the best sight was when uh, Maria's came on. Maria's came on because I could finally see. But um, I'm trying to see who has already gone. Can somebody put up their hand if they don't, if they haven't had a turn? I know I haven't heard Megan say anything, but um, okay, who's that person? Somebody popped something up. Yeah. But, if Maybe not, whoever's in charge, look and see who it is, and I'll say, yes, pick that person. <laughs> That's Leslie what I usually do when I can't see. Leslie or Alana or Megan or Marie. I, I like all of them, so you pick. <laughs> I'm delegating my authority to somebody. Else. I think Megan should go since she thought of the question. Perfect. Go ahead, Megan. So when I went to grad school down in San Diego, I lived in La Jolla down by the beach. And I lived all by myself for the first time ever, not in my family home, not in a sorority home, not in a dorm, which had been much bigger. Uh, I had this shoebox and I was, I loved it, but I felt a little uneasy living alone in a bottom floor basement. And one night it was storming and storming and storming. And all of a sudden I get a loud knock on the door and I look out the little people and it's a cop. And I mean, you're just, whenever you see somebody you're not expecting, especially somebody official, it can be frightening, right? So I opened the door with the chain on and he said, do you own such and such a car? And I said, I do. Why? And it turned out that when the storm, the palm trees had, palm fronds had fallen and my tire, because it was on a hill, which is supposed to be at an angle, had wedged that palm frond in and unfortunately, I flooded out a store and I wasn't responsible for it. <laughs> As a graduate student, I wouldn't have been able to afford much. Anyway, there wasn't really anything I could do about it, but it was just that heart sinking moment where you're like, am I in trouble? And did somebody I love die? Like you don't know why they're there. And it turned out my car was just in error. <laughs> Leslie, how about you? Well, I was, um when I thought back, it, I realized I have a little bit in common with the with the tenant families. Um, my the first home that I 
lived in out when after I graduated from college was in Peru. I'd gone to do earthquake reconstruction work in uh, Chimbote. And I lived in a one of the few cement houses that survived uh, the earthquake um, in an area that um, had no electricity and no no running water. And um, the we had a, a wasn't exactly an outhouse. It was more like an outdoor pit toilet out in the back of the lot. And my mother came down to visit uh, the first year that I was there. And the my girlfriend that I was um, living with there at that time took the opportunity to paint the cement toilet bright yellow. And there was a can with a little flower that was on the on top of the cement toilet. So it was all nice for my mom when she when she came to visit. So yeah, that's that. Um, Ron's here with me. Do you want to share where your first house was? Uh, well, go I... just get into the. <laughs> no, where I. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. My well. It actually wasn't my first, but it was almost my first house away. It was in Madrid, in, in Spain. And I went to study with the University of California there. And it, uh, I lived in a what they call a piso, which is a, a flat, basically. And uh, the, the funny story doesn't really revolve around that, but I'm sort of the opposite of Laura, who spoke at the beginning. I was... Uh, walking with a friend of mine in Santa Barbara at the university when I was at the university we were walking supporting the candidacy of uh well I won't say which party but anyway uh and we came up to a house to talk to the people and they didn't seem to be too interested but they had the red light on the front door so. <laughs> <laughs> but the politics was not what they were wor were worried about so okay doke okay. Um, <laughs> uh, there are two people left, Marie and Alana. <laughs> Did you? Oh, me? I'm sorry, uh, Marie. <laughs> Can't even pick your own daughter. Unmute, Marie. As many of you know, I come from a large family, and I had been living in the, the family home in my own room, sort of like an apartment. But when I moved out for the first time all on my own, it was a studio apartment upstairs in Van Nuys with one window. And that window was downwind of the Budweiser Brewery. So the only way that you ever got any ventilation was that stench, which I couldn't stand. So I spent the entire summer when I first moved in swimming in the pool and sunbathing, I paid the price for the sunbathing. Um, but it was like Peyton Place. It was young people and everybody got to know me. And for whatever reason, they all decided that they were my big brother and they felt that I needed a family. And I kept trying to explain that I've got plenty of family, but they all wanted to adopt me and heaven forbid that some, a guest come over and be rude to me, all of these men in the complex would say, <laughs> you, she's a lady, you treat her like a lady, <laughs> and if she doesn't throw you in the pool, we will. <laughs> so it was just like going from one family with hardly any brothers to an, an entire complex of, of people who are all going to be my, my, my big brother. Um, but there were lots of, aside from the brewery and that awful stench, um, it was, it was really a, a marvelous experience. Alana. All right. So before I share mine, I'll share, um, Sandra's watching over on YouTube. And so she shared that, um, her second home is always going to be her grandmother's home. That's in Obispo Morelia in Michoacan, Mexico. And she said her favorite place is under a tree where she was able to see the cows and she loved sitting there on a nice day. She further said, 
that she thinks she liked it there because the chickens would not follow her there because they were always chasing her. Um, and then I also was chased by birds as a child. So we bonded over that. And she said, thanks to the chickens, she was able to find that tree and it was a pomegranate tree. So she always got a snack out of being <laughs> over there as well. Um, so I, I enjoyed that story. Um, and then for myself, I, I grew up in a lot of houses. So uh, there, this house where um, Ron and Leslie and I all are right now, um, but also like I was close with both of my um, grandmothers and um, a grandfather and my cousins. And so I feel like I was like almost in their houses as much as mine. Um, and then the first time I went away and kind of made my own home was when I went to college. Um, and it was really exciting and kind of figuring out who I was, but I know the, the first time that I really got homesick when I went away to school was the first time I got sick and had to take care of myself. And I was like lying there in bed, like, I miss my parents. I have to go to the store all by myself and buy my medicine. So that was, uh, that was kind of my first home. And then after college, I ended up coming back here. Uh, where I am now, back in my childhood home with my parents. So full circle. Just just part of the circle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it's you're, you're not full ended. circle yet, Alana. <laughs> I had planned to go out again. <laughs> just to date, right? <laughs> it's just part of the arc. <laughs> All right. I think we covered everybody. Thank you for sharing your stories. And I just have... A few quick announcements before we all say goodbye. Uh, remember the volunteer open house is Saturday at 11 o'clock and uh, people who are house docents or school docents, we have a lot of uh, uh, special tours coming up. So please check on Volgistics next uh, May 25th. That's Thursday, June 6th, 7th and 8th. And then June three, four, and five, we have the Getty program and we need lots of volunteers for that. And remember that the Spanish language uh, uh, training is starting June 25th. Let anybody know that you think might like that. And of course, we still have gardening going on every Tuesday morning, Garden Crafts, the first Friday of the month. And as always, public hours going on and story time readers every Tuesday. If uh, you haven't done it and you're thinking about joining uh, Nancy, uh, Michelle, or Ina in being a storyteller, we'd love to have you. And next month, virtual gathering will uh, be on the summer solstice, as we already mentioned. And thank you all for being here. And good night. Good night. Hi to everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night. Laura, is this going to be um, seen another way? Like, because I heard it all, but I couldn't see the very few things. So I like to look back. Is it going to be recorded? Yes. Yeah, that. But I mean, but it'll so be, I could click up. It's click on, on our YouTube, YouTube, Marcia. It'll be. Yeah, on that's what YouTube. I was hoping. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's what I was. Thanks. All right. Bye. I'm not going to find out. Get off. I will end the meeting for everyone now. I hope you all.